The logical decision of many young men was there's no such thing as British justice. Uh, we've tried to cooperate with their inquiry. Uh, it was a whitewash. The only way forward is to take up arms. Right. Uh, it went out of control. And then and you're talking specifically about the IRA and the more militant fraction yeah. of the IRA. Yeah, they, they were certainly right. there, yeah. but after Bloody Sunday, I mean, it went completely out of control. And many mm -hmm. young men and women joined the IRA, and it took 25 years to get it back on track. So being so young, what what made you not want to join? Was it just because you were only 15? Or if there, I mean, because yeah, I'm uh, assuming some of your friends were getting involved in some of that activity. Because it would be hard not to, to be in that situation where you tried to do it the right way, and then yeah. you're met with senseless violence like that. And I mean, many of um, my neighbors ended up joining the IRA. I was 15. If I had been 17, it would have been much harder to, to actually resist. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that I didn't think about it or didn't even try, uh, but uh, I think that then, you know, having watched Bloody Sunday, and then there were other moments of violence that I had witnessed, and mm -hmm. uh, Slowly but surely, I came to a conclusion that violence is not the way. Right. You know, violence mm -hmm. is not the way. I I remember uh, one occasion uh, I was working in an alcohol drug abuse rehabilitation centre. I was a volunteer, and our our, um, our my rostrum was from six o'clock on a Saturday through to midday on a Sunday. It was to give the daytime staff uh, evenings and weekends off. So I was on the weekend and. Once the residents had gone to bed at night, my job was to just make sure the place was secure and then I could retire. But on Sunday morning, I remember we'd woken up by four shots and a scream. And I ran out and I found a man who'd just been uh, assassinated. And I still remember the blood pumping out of his head and his chest. But I remember standing over him was his teenage son and daughter. And they were clasping each other in shocked horror as they looked at the slain body of their father. And he was an RUC, off-duty RUC officer who was coming home from, or coming with his children from church, and had been shot dead by the IRA. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, violence just doesn't inflict physical wounds. It inflicts spiritual and historical wounds. Because if I was that teenage son and daughter and I saw that happen to my father, I would ensure those who did it would never achieve their objectives. And mm -hmm. so you'd have this hardening of the heart and a digging in of the heels and a more vociferous cry of no surrender. But I remember thinking as well that, you know, in time, that teenage son and daughter would tell their children and their grandchildren what had happened to their father and grandfather and so on, and how that act of violence would pulsate and ripple through the generations. And I think that more than anything made me realize, you know, there has to be a different way. Was that one of your inspirations for writing, you know, delving deeper into the subject matter to write the book that because no, I mean, I mean that, in a way, that's approaching it in a non-violent way, but still getting sort of the message across, and yeah. eventually did, you know, lead to some resolution. You know, I got into journalism and I got into filmmaking purely by default. It wasn't a choice, mm -hmm. and it was because at the age of thirty-eight, I discovered I'm dyslexic, and up until that, I thought I was stupid, and I got I went through life, uh, you know, doubting my intellectual capabilities, and then at the age of thirty-eight, I make this discovery and. They do intelligence tests, they tell me I'm a pretty high IQ. And I think that gave me the courage then to deal with a subject like this. But it, again, it came by default. I was home visiting my widowed mother in Derry. I was walking up Roswell Street where Bloody Sunday happened. I just happened to meet Tony Doherty, whose father was shot dead on Bloody Sunday. And he said to me, Don, I read your statement. And I said, what statement? He says, the one you gave him Bloody Sunday. I had completely forgotten. And then I remembered retracing my steps with my best friend, come back down to the barricade. I remember Michael Kelly was two and a half feet from me when we shot. I mean, the most vivid memory I have of Bloody Sunday is a sound and it's mm -hmm. And it was as the bullet hit Michael Kelly and he collapsed at my feet. And, um, you know, I remember then Shawnee and I meeting an older, I was actually the assistant manager of our football team and Shawnee got me to tell my story about Michael Kelly and Murray Gormley then sat down there taking statements for child primary school, I think you should give a statement. So they walked me, and I remember lining up with people and giving my little statement. Mm -hmm. So I became curious as to what I'd written. I went back to find the statement, and uh, you know, I was brought into a human rights center and an old battered filing cabinet, and they searched through it, and they gave me a well-worn plastic supermarket bag, and they said, your statement's in there, and as I started to go through them, I realized I was now in possession of primary source historical documents 
of one of the seminal events of modern Irish history. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, I thought these might be the only statements available. So I thought of publishing them and I asked the families and they gave me permission. And that became Eyewitness Bloody Sunday and it became a phenomenon. And, um, and it's credited as leading to the new inquiry. Was it immediately clear by the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the non-violent, you know, the, 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 the march that you were part of that they, they, there were no shots fired by that side? You know, by you know the, the, that you know, like the IRA. Was there some confusion initially that maybe the IRA had fired upon them, or like people were semi-believing some of the reports, or was it just like no, clear that they had? We deal with it very honestly, mm -hmm. and that the. I mean, I remember one. Of, it was my first civil rights march, and part of the reason why my parents gave me permission to take part in it was, the word in our community was that the IRA had agreed to stay away. And we were living in no-go areas at the time. We'd barricade, we'd built barricades on our streets and mm -hmm. in the entrances to our estate. And the only time the British Army would come in would be in pre-dawn raids. And we had vigilantes mm -hmm. out there who would watch for the army, and if the army moved, there would be bin lids mm -hmm. rattling. Well, and essentially it was policed by the IRA, right? The no-go no zone, uh, I mean. Yeah, and so there was many nights we would stay awake, like mm -hmm. with fierce gun battles on the periphery. Yeah. And sometimes the army would come in, and I remember getting up and going out with neighbors to resist the, the British army as, as a kid, and throwing stones, and then we'd go to school. Mm -hmm. In the morning, it was extraordinary. I've just written a, an article for the 50th anniversary of uh, our school uh, for, a, for a, a book, and it's called uh, School in No Man's Land. And it's, it's just about teachers trying to teach kids in, mm -hmm. in the midst of a, of a war. Um, but, you know, um, they, there was always, we knew it was only a matter of time before the, the army would come in and take down the no-go areas in Belfast and in Derry. And so the IRA agreed to stay on the periphery to try and slow them up because there was a fear that once the people had moved down into the valley of the bog side that they might come in mm -hmm. on the, uh, through the Craigan from the, the countryside. But of course that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there were, again we show this, after the army shot dead two people, or sorry, they sh shot and wounded two people, it was an, an elderly man and a teenager, a guy who played football with Bubble Stonehey. Um, there was an official IRA r r rifleman who mm -hmm. fired a shot, and we show that clearly. Right. We know yeah. that, but he, we know he was remonstrated with as well. And then there is what we call the Father Daly gunman. Father Daly was the priest who is seen leading away one of the bodies. And while he was giving the last rites, he saw a man with a handgun fire some shots. But none of the army were injured mm -hmm. on the day. In fact, there was one soldier who was actually shot on the day, and he shot himself through the foot. You know, so. so um, yeah. But I mean, and, and even clearly, there's there's shots of people just running away, and then there's open fire on people. Who are, I mean, I, know, I, so. I there's three minutes of that day, the memory of which I've never been able uh, to recover, and and I think it's that moment in Glenfetta Park where you see the crowd mm -hmm. uh, as the army move and running away, and they literally just fired from the hip. Yeah. And some of the most horrific killings happened that day. I mean, there was one man who was already wounded, uh, Jim Ray, and a paratrooper came up and shot him in the back, you know. Um, so he executed an already wounded man. Um, there was a man with his hands in the air saying, don't shoot, don't right. shoot, and they fired him. And all of these things were seen. And that was the power of the statements. There was about 600 statements that I read. You cannot get a community to agree on a collective lie. And what was powerful about these statements was, you know, they were repetitive. In fact, it became boring after a while mm -hmm. because people were saying the same thing over and over again. And in the end, I didn't use all 600 statements. I used a selection of, of, uh, of, of 100 and told people, here you can get the, the statements, the other statements if you want. Uh, but that, that was the extraordinary thing. People knew that innocent, unarmed civilians had been shot there that day mm -hmm. and that a massive cover-up had happened. So once the book is published, then we want to talk about just uh, how, how well it was received and some of the things that developed after that. You can imagine, I'd never done a book before, yeah. so I was terrified. Yeah. And uh, so the, I was in Dublin. And, and in doing the book, too, I remember one night, the hardest area for me, there was the, the last piece of the book wasn't the introduction. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't the various chapters. It was, it was actually about Glenfada Park. And I still think because that had to be my escape route. 
at the time, and that's the three minutes are missing. And that was the last chapter. I remember that night, I realized there were two psychopaths who were let loose uh, on the people who had, between them, had killed at least eight people, you know? And I knew they were still out there. And I also knew the British system could be very vicious. We, we had human rights lawyers like Rosemary Nelson and, and Pat Finucan who had been murdered you know, in the process of, of trying to bring about justice. And there had been journalists killed. So, I mean, I began to think, well, it's possible. Mm -hmm. And I remember going through the night of terror. Uh, because I, that was the other thing. I, I began from 11 o'clock until 6, 7 o'clock in the morning because it was a time when I wouldn't be disturbed. There was no phone calls or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just remember going through that. But I realized I have to do this. And if I'm killed, I'm killed. But this has to be confronted. And when the book came out, uh, <laughs> I was in Dublin at the time, and I began to get phone calls saying, you know, they're not only selling the book in, in bookshops, it's been sold in butcher shops and in bakeries and news agents, and, and there were people going around door selling it and stuff, yeah. you know. So, and I remember when I arrived in Derry the day for the book launch, I remember going along the Strand Road, and there was a guy coming out of a, a confectionery shop, and he was reading the book going to his, yeah. his car. So that, that really surprised me. And I had friends then who come up for the book launch. Uh, it was in a big community center in the Craigan. And uh, he walked in and he walked out. Because he thought the people were there to play bingo. <laughs> <laughs> because 700 people had turned up yeah. for it. Because I think they realized that there were aspects of the book had turned a corner. Mm -hmm. That at last we were in a position where we could help to make the British accountable. And uh, so the book is credited as being a primary catalyst, but I would never claim it was the catalyst because it was building on the work of other journalists. I mean, there's a guy who appears in the film called Eamon McCann did wonderful work. And, uh, and, and there were other journalists, including the late Dr. Raymond McLean wrote a wonderful book, which was very important in terms of my research called uh, The Road to Bloody Sunday. Yeah, and whenever you have a successful book, then you're, normally the, the film industry comes calling, right? As they're always quick to follow those successes. So uh, you want to talk about that process as far as how Paul, I'm assuming Paul Greengrass uh, was yeah. initially the one in contact with you, or was there well, another producer? there already was a film being made in Derry on Bloody Sunday, and I wasn't part of it. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, I was living in Dublin at the stage, and, uh, and I had all the work to do anyway. And uh, then my publisher contacted me to say that a guy called Paul Greengrass was looking for me. He didn't give Paul my phone number, but Paul left his. So I rang Paul, and he told me who he was. I hadn't a clue who yeah, he was. Yeah. And um, he asked, could he meet me in Belfast uh, in the Europa Hotel? So I uh, agreed to meet him, and I met him and Mark Redhead, and he said that he told me that as a, as a teenager, he had he'd watched a film uh, called The Battle of Algiers. In fact, I think it's 50 years today, The Battle of Algiers. It's Pontecovo, I think is the name of the director. But he said he was so moved with this, he said, I want to make a film like this one day. And he says, I feel it's Bloody Sunday. And he said, I'd like you to come on a journey with me. And I said, well, Paul, there's two things. One, there's already a movie being made in, in Derry, so you need to be aware of that, although I think the subject's big enough to cater for two. But I said, also, we need to talk to the families and the wounded. So I brought them down to Derry, and, and I took them around all of the families. And um, I had built up a lot of trust with the families, they had a lot of respect for me. And uh, I remember in meeting uh, Michael McDade's sister, uh, Betty, and I remember she said to the two lads, and I think this was indicative, she said, lads, I don't trust you because you're English. Yeah, I was going to ask, yeah. I mean, she yes. says, but I trust Don, yeah. and if Don, Don's involved, then it's okay. And, uh, and like, later when we got the Berlin um, Golden Bear, at, at that festival, I remember afterwards, Mark Redhead saying, Don, we couldn't have done this without you, because there was a lot of very tricky local politics to get through, mm -hmm. including a lot of resentment from the other film that we had come in to make, yeah. to make a movie as well. So you had to deal with all of that. So in addition to those early conversations, um, were you involved with the, the, script, the script that yes, was developed in yes. the story and, and deciding like what point of view, where to start the story? Because I mean, obviously they clearly they could have started really at any point. What were, were you like, who made the decision to have it take place over the span of one day as opposed well, to I like... I think really Paul. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have to be very fair and very honest here in that, I mean, I knew very little about filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And for me, 
you know, turns out that I had the opportunity to, in a sense, walk alongside a master. And he was a wonderful director, I have to say. I mean, it's not to say that we didn't fight. It's not to say that we didn't have fallouts. Mm -hmm. It's not to say we didn't have agreements, because we did. Um, and of course, you know, I had the opportunity to, to read the script as it was evolving. And uh, I was also able to, you know, my, my book was the inspiration for it. But by that stage, the book also had helped to bring about the conditions whereby Prime Minister Blair announced a new Bloody Sunday inquiry. So of course, this flood literally of um, documents that had been hidden for you know, mm -hmm. two, two and a half decades suddenly became available. And I knew the lawyers very well, and they began to feed that information as well. In fact, there's two lawyers credited at the end, uh, and Peter Madden and Desmond J. Doherty. Did so that new information then help shape the British absolutely. side of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in yeah. fact, you know, you too, before they would give us permission to use that recording at the end, that was actually a recording that Paul Greengrass had made of a live concert that he was making a documentary about uh, you two, and he had recorded that. Um, they wanted to see the movie, first of all, and there were some of the shootings that we depict, like, for example, the man being shot lying on the ground, and uh, they wanted to know, like, was this fiction or was it fact? And we were able to produce the forensic evidence to show that, and the eyewitness statements to show that, in fact, this is exactly what happened. And it was only after that they gave us permission to, to use to that use uh, recording. Yeah, um, and then uh, I know I understand. Uh, clearly, Ivan Cooper would be a, a solid choice to include in the cast. But what about the the young man? Is it Jer Jared? Yeah, is Jerry it? Donahue. Yeah. So yeah. why why choose him out of all the victims and, and sort of following his because story? Because he was probably uh, the one who was most vulnerable to the British saying he had. Um, he was the one who was seriously wounded as he tried to run away. He mm -hmm. had been in prison because. Um, He'd been caught rioting. He was also a member of the FIANA, which was kind of the youth wing of the IRA. Mm -hmm. And uh, the British claimed that he was carrying nail bombs. Now, again, when you took, I mean, uh, there was a, a Dublin doctor who happened to be in Derry, and he dealt with, he said, absolutely not. And of course, when you see the photographs of Jerry Dunne, he was wearing these tight denim jeans at the time, and they were so tight in order to get the nail bombs in his pocket, they actually had to open his fly and pull down the zip for them to fit, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, the reality is we knew, all of us would have known that to get Jerry Donaghy to Alton Galvin Hospital, you had to take him across the bridge. There was only one bridge from the West Bank to the East Bank and then onto the hospital, which meant you were going to be crossing a number of army checkpoints. And of course, if he was carrying nail bombs, he would have been stripped down, you know? But the reality is, Jerry Donaghy, he was seriously wounded, and the late uh, Dr. McLean said to me, Don, the, the wounds were so severe he never would have survived anyway, but he was still alive when the car was stopped by uh, a British checkpoint. And um, the driver and the passenger were taken away, and then the still living Jerry Donaghy was drove, driv driven away to under the bridge. And the next time Jerry Donnie was produced, he was not only dead, but he had the nail bombs, you know. So there were a lot of those issues which are very, very infuriating. Yeah. Um, were you satisfied with the finished product of the film? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I think for me, you know, the, um, the litmus test was the families. And we promised the families that they would be the first to see it before it had a public screening in Derry. And that, of course, was a big, big... A challenge as well, and uh, at the very end of it, the, f the families actually gave us a standing ovation. So that that was important. That was a wonderful endorsement because we wanted to be true uh, to the families. And yeah. uh, and you know, I think again, it's very important, like you know, for a young audience to understand that what's powerful about this film is not just you know the process of making it, but it was it was an Irish and, and British collaboration. And I think that Paul Greengrass and Mark Redhead, who were my two main companions and colleagues in, in making this film, I think they showed enormous courage. And in fact, I mean, Paul Greengrass was attacked by elements of the British media afterwards. And there was one um, Irish journalist, um, uh, but who was quite sympathetic to the British position, accused him of being a traitor. I mean, it was extraordinary. And yet, I think that uh, 
Greengrass showed far more courage than Prime Minister Heath at the time, who was involved in the cover-up. And I think that you know, if Heath had shown the same courage as Greengrass and Redhead back in 1972, I don't think we would have had over 3,000 people dead today. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously this film was not your, your last movie that you were involved in, and you went on to work on Oma, which is, there was sort of a trilogy of films. This was the first yeah. sort of introducing the troubles, and then Oma sh sort of showed the middle, and yeah. then the, the last in Five Minutes to Heaven was sort of the resolution of these, uh, sort of these yes. conflicted emotions on both sides. Yeah. That I left over, but you want to talk about maybe Oma and just how your well, involvement in that? Paul or? Greengrass asked me would I work with him on uh, a film about the Oma bombing. The Oma bombing was happened in 1998, and it was right in the midst of the peace process, and it was aimed at destroying the peace process. And um, I said, yeah, I would do it. So my first assignment was to go to Oma and to meet with the families. And this was an IRA bombing, you know? It was a, a, a dissident IRA, right, right. you know, because at this stage Sinn Féin right. had really pulled, Wrangled reined in, in yeah. the provisional IRA. There was a, a lock-solid ceasefire. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that for all the criticism of Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, I mean, these guys, I think, you know, have done a remarkable job in bringing a very disciplined army, which the British Army could not defeat, mm -hmm. and brought them along, you know. But there were obviously people unhappy and who broke away. And these dissidents set the bomb. But it wasn't as simple as that because, I mean, we know now that British intelligence knew that this bomb was actually coming to Oma. And I mean, some of the families that I dealt with were Protestant families and who would have seen the police force at the time to have been the bedrock of protecting the society that they mm -hmm. believed in. And I remember going with Guy Hibbert, who was the, uh, the main writer of the, the movie Oma, um, to a meeting one night of a number of the families and there was incredible anger towards the police and I realized afterwards most of this anger was coming from Protestant families, you know. So I was sent up there and I, I had to deal with all of the families, every single one of them and, you know, and it was really tough assignment, a really tough assignment. Some were quite hostile, some were very sympathetic and they realized the importance of keeping this issue alive and in the public. And I remember one, uh, Lawrence Rush, who's whose wife Libby had been like literally, literally blown to piece, pieces. And uh, while I was talking to him, he broke down and he wept sorrowfully. Oh, and his big issue was that he had never got a chance to say goodbye to his wife. And he tried to open the coffin, but people couldn't let him do it because all there was was bits of body in yeah. there, you know. And I remember he wept sorrowfully for, and I could only cry with him, you know. Because, yeah. I mean, I'm, I mean, you're a human being, you know? Yeah. So, so that, that was important. And then, of course, in the midst of that, Paul gets the call up to, uh, to do the Bourne movie. Right, yeah. You know? And that became even difficult then because he then becomes a proxy director from Berlin. And he's someone kind of there giving him feedback every night. And there's a new director brought in, Travis, and people weren't entirely happy with him. They would have preferred him working with him. And it was tough for him as yeah. well because he was trying to direct a film while there was, <laughs> was kind of like a puppeteer director, in the background. Yeah, right. and, but, but I think we made you know, a very powerful movie as well, yeah. a very powerful movie. And that was about the end of the troubles and then five minutes of heaven. Um, Guy Hibbert was the one who asked me to work uh, on that one was really about the difficulties of post-conflict society mm. and the difficult issues of, of, um, of reconciliation and, and whether it can happen, you know? Yeah. So, um, and then the ending for that film in particular, there was some controversy, right, as far as, because yeah. uh, of... The, well, we had a, we had a, a German um, mm -hmm. film director, uh, you know, very, um, well-established and respected German uh, director, um, Oliver Hirschbiegel. And, um, you know, he, um, I suppose I, I have to be honest, young filmmakers here, you see, I, because I didn't aspire to be part of the film industry, <laughs> I mean, I'm not overawed by these people, you know? Yeah. And, I felt that the film industry, you know, was one of the most conservative industries that I'd ever dealt with, you know. 
and uh, it can do radical things, it can do very progressive things, but as an institution, it's, it's quite conservative, you know, and like the director, in a sense, is like the Pope, mm -hmm. you know, you don't question him. Yeah. And I don't believe in that, you know, and, um, and in fairness, I'll go back to Greengrass and the genius of Greengrass after it, because his approach was very different to Herr Spiegel. But uh, Herr Spiegel had a very definite ending that he wanted to bring about. And this movie was about, and we actually had uh, the murderer, the actual murderer, per, you know, working with us. And the witness to the murder was, uh, I, the murderer was a young teenager who had shot dead uh, a Catholic, young Catholic man. And the murder had been witnessed by a 10-year-old boy. So we had tr tracked down the murderer and we tracked down the 10-year-old boy and both had agreed to actually work with us, but mm -hmm. neither of them ever came apart. We had hoped maybe in the process of the film that they might agree to meet, but Alistair, who was the murderer, he actually played by um, Liam Neeson. Mm -hmm. Um, he would have been prepared to meet Joe, but Joe couldn't bring himself to actually uh, meet uh, Alistair in the end. Um, but it, I was the person responsible for Joe, and Joe was very traumatized. He was played by the same actor who plays um, Ivan Cooper in Bloody Sunday, Jimmy Nesbitt. He was absolutely brilliant, and Joe was very hi highly strong, you know. And uh, you know the the character that Jimmy Nesbitt plays is absolutely brilliant. It's almost got Joe to a T, full of nervous tension, you know. Mm -hmm. A very intelligent guy, but never had an opportunity and the troubles kind of destroyed his life in many respects. But not only did Joe then have to deal with the real Alistair who was in the background, but he also had to deal with the Alistair we were creating on the silver screen. And in the movie there is a fictional scene where Alistair and Joe meet and there's a big fight and they fall through a window and it looks as though they're dead and then there's a resurrection scene almost. But Alistair gets up and he says to Joe, you know, you've two beautiful daughters, forget about me, I'm not important, live for your daughters. And it's a nice moment in a sense and it's a nice message yeah. as he walks away. But the real Joe saying, who the F does he think he is to be telling me how to live my life sure. after ruining it? So. That's what we had to deal with. And then Herr Spiegel at the very end, he has a piece, and I'm invited, by the way, to see the film, and I'm told it's locked, okay? And you know what locked means, you know? So what you're seeing now is how it's going to go out, and there's nothing can be done. So of course, when I was told it was locked, I said, okay. I sat down in a film studio with others to watch it, and at the very end, <laughs> there was an ending, and I said, there's no way. There's absolutely no ways Herr Spiegel getting away with this. And it was a phone call that was made to Alistair. And the phone call was a kind of anonymous voice saying, Alistair, Joe has gone to therapy, right? Because Alistair wanted Joe to go to therapy to get help. And, uh, and kind of Liam Neeson playing Alistair then kind of looks up to heaven as if to say, thank God he's doing what I wanted. <laughs> and I was thinking, this is the perpetrator, like, sure. redeeming the victim. Yeah. You know, absolutely no way. I mean, could you imagine doing a movie yeah. where Nazis, you know, redeem Holocaust victims? Right. You know, I mean, how offensive would that be? Yeah. And uh, I raised the issue at the end, and uh, Herr Spiegel got very annoyed. I won't go into yeah. what happened, but it was very, very annoyed. And he was rushing to the airport, and uh, he went round and he shook hands with everybody on the team except me, right? And people are looking at me, and I've got to a point where <laughs> doesn't, that doesn't bother me anymore. I just quietly get into my car, drove home. I had 40 minutes to think about it, and <laughs> I sat down and I wrote what I think was probably my most important intervention. And I wrote to the producers and executive producers, and I said, if we allow this to happen, not only are we going to betray the trust of two people who invested their trust in us, but we're also going to tarnish a process which we agreed at the beginning would be about truth and reconciliation. Yeah. And I said, Herr Spiegel can go off and pick up his golden bear, you know, or whatever prize he gets, but he leaves behind us. And it's our war, and it's our reconciliation, and it's our shit that we have to deal with, you know, and this cannot be allowed to finish. Yeah. So uh, in the end, we forced the unlocking of the film yeah. and the compromise was that um, 
there was a voiceover and it was Joe uh, who actually makes the call saying, uh, Alistair, uh, this is Joe. Uh, I just want to say it's over. It's over. So it was the victim taking yeah. responsibility. And uh, I think, you know, that was kind of a, a fine compromise yeah. in the end. But we, and I think, you know, if we had let Herr Spiegel's end, it would have actually destroyed the process. And I don't think the film would have, uh, it might even have destroyed, like, he got, he won Sundance, I think, best, best yeah. director for well, I think all, th all three films do a nice job of, of presenting the troubles and, yeah. and a, a nice overview, and there's a, a definitely a solid arc. And clearly your involvement was necessary from the first through all of them. You can yeah, see I, that there's I, a lot of... Yeah, I, I, whenever you're dealing with difficult subject matter like this, you always want to have somebody who, yeah. on the ground who can really speak to the experience rather than, you know, some German yeah. coming in and, you know, thinking yeah, they know and the I mean, whole I, I, and I, mean I, have, I have a wonderful German friend, you yeah. know, and I, I mean, it's, it's not because Oliver was German. No, 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 I but you know what I'm saying, an outsider. But, or, but yeah, yeah but, but I think, you know, I think that was a very important role that I played in all yeah. three films and that I was kind of the the human connection between the production and the community that we were dealing with, you know. Yeah. In the case of uh, Five Minutes of Heaven, it was obviously just one individual and his family. Um, but uh, in terms of Bloody Sunday, it was the dairy community as well as the families and the wounded. And then in Oma, I'd built up a lot of, uh, you know, um, relationships and respect with, with, with the families yeah. there. So that was important. I remember in Oma as well, I had done a book about the Dublin Man and bombings after Bloody Sunday, which was about the biggest unsolved mass murder in the history of the Irish Republic. It was four bombs went off, three in Dublin, which were synchronized, which I believe was British military intelligence who put the bombs together, and it was loyalists who delivered the bombs, and they were, were delivering a message to the, the government of the Irish Republic. But I remember talking to one of the victims uh, who had survived, and she told me that after the bomb went off in Talbot Street, she was working in a shoe shop and she just remembers being deaf. And it was like then someone slowly turned up the sound. I remember that and I, I told the director about that and in fact we, um, we, we actually did that. And mm -hmm. when we showed it to the families, of course, it go, after the explosion it goes silent. But in the audience, there was this woman started to scream and people who were there thought it was part of the film, but I knew mm. we've, we've trouble here. Mm. And it was one of the victims and whatever, when the bomb went off, it just yeah. triggered the, it triggered the, um, the trauma right, again. Yeah. Right, well, I think we're gonna open up to questions. And uh, if you do have a question, we ask that you use the uh, mic that's over on the left hand side, my left. And then if you could just keep your questions brief, but if anybody has a question for Don, I'd like to. They're rendered speechless. Uh, I'm sure they are. Um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Anything about the film? Or here's one brave yeah. song. I just want to say something afterwards about Paul Greengrass before we yeah. go. I noticed in the little biography that um, we got that you've been to some other countries, and I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, I'm very pleased to say that um, I'm now a member of staff, part-time member of staff at DePaul University, and I'm, I'm working at the School of Public Service. But um, the School of New Learning uh, gave me a, an honorary degree last year, which was my first connection with DePaul, and it was a wonderful experience. And I got to know Father Holzneider, the president, and he was very moved by uh, a project that I'm developing in Flanders about the First World War. And uh, I don't know if anyone's seen a movie, but I really encourage you to see it, or maybe we should have a screening here sometime, <laughs> called Joy Noel. It's about the Christmas truce of 1914, when German and British soldiers and French soldiers, they stopped fighting and they met in no man's land. And it was an extraordinary moment of humanity uh, in the midst of this terrible war of carnage, which eventually took the lives of 18 million people. So I'm putting together a project called the, the Christmas Truce Project in Flanders, in a town called Mazines. The world knows about the Christmas Truce, but they've nowhere to go. So I've talked to the mayor and I said, look, Mazines was at the heart of it. And why don't we rebrand Mazines, the city of the Christmas Truce? Part of that day was they played a game of football, German and British, and so we're creating the Flanders Peace Field where young people can come and play football. 
there's a big peace village there uh, coming out of the Irish peace process. I won't go into the details there, but it was like a white elephant, 140 beds for kids. No one was using it. And I said, look, we can use that and bring kids so that they can meet and dialogue from Europe and conflict areas. And uh, we've also created an international Christmas truce carol and folk festival because it was singing voices that drew the soldiers out of their trenches. So that's one of them. I'm working on a big project about Frederick Douglass. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Frederick Douglass came to Ireland after the publication of his narrative in 1845. He had a wonderful experience of four and a half months in Ireland. And Ireland actually had a transformative influence on him because he came as a single issue person about ending slavery in America. But when he left Ireland, he was an internationalist about ending injustice all over the world. So there are just some of the, the projects. And I want to, I really would love to develop those projects with different schools in Nepal as well. So, so if anybody's interested afterwards, I'd, maybe we can work together, you know. Thank you very much. You, were, you said you wanted to mention something else about Paul Greengrass. The, the genius of Paul Greengrass, you know. Um, I remember I, I went with my, uh, my eldest daughter, who was a teenager at the time and who wanted to do uh, dramatic performance, and she eventually did that. Um, she got her degree in it, but I, Paul allowed us to sit in on the first occasion when he brought the actors together. But they had all received the script, and what he said was, okay, you know the script and you've learned your lines, and now what I want you to do is forget them. And he said, I want you to see the script as the roadmap, but I want you to interact as normally as you can. So, you know, whatever words come to your mind, which sound more natural, forget about my script. And I think that's what really works in the film. Yeah. You know, that's, but, you know, a lot of the people even too, you can see are struggling with the words, but that's, that's life, you know. Yeah, it certainly goes along with the aesthetic of the film with the handheld cameras and the cinema yeah. verite sort of, you know, really gets you into the, the action as far yeah. as, you know, and feeling like you were there. So. Yeah, that, I think that's what really drew Hollywood's attention to Paul because yeah. I remember we had a screening in New York and there was a bishop who was there came to me and asked, he says, God, where did you get all the footage? He actually thought he'd watched a documentary. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that was, that was yeah. quite powerful, actually, that. And, of course, using no lighting and using natural lighting. And, yeah. I mean, that's part of the genius. We have to get green grass to come here at some point. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that style also went with the other films as well, right? Yeah, yeah the, so. the one that he was um, nominated for an Oscar for, which was uh, United 93. Right. Um, the, the, the plane went down. In, um, in Pennsylvania, um, he used, again, the same yes, yeah. handheld um, method, and it, and it really worked. Yeah. We do have another question. Yeah. Hi. Um, seeing as the book and the movie was the primary catalyst, I was wondering if you like, remember you know, June 15th and your reaction and where you were and how you felt about his formal apology. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I wasn't in Derry. Um, I was in Malibu. I'd just come back from Hawaii. I was researching a book about a priest called Father Damien of Molokai who had died of leprosy in the 19th century. And there's an actress called Roma Downey from Derry who was there on Bloody Sunday as well. Uh, Roma would be famous for Touched by an Angel. She played the angel Monica. And she had married Mark Burnett, who's a famous reality television guy. And and she invited me to stay with her. And when she invited me to stay with her, we had no idea that the Bloody Sunday report was going to go to Parliament. So we, I was with Roma. It was just nice to be with a dairy person. And uh, we were very emotional. You know, I was getting phone calls. I was getting texts from the families and the wounded and people in Derry and so on. And, uh, and I have to say, uh, when word came through how Prime Minister uh, David Cameron had reacted, it was way beyond what we expected. And I think that the dignity of Cameron and the fact that he stood before con Congress, or sorry, stood before Parliament and he said, you know, that the facts in this report are irrefutable and what happened on Bloody Sunday was unjustified and unjustifiable and he declared the, the, the dead and the wounded um, exonerated and innocent. Um, and he apologized. I mean, that was one of the great healing moments between uh, the very fraught histories of Ireland and, and the United Kingdom. And it was also a moment that, 
created the conditions for the first visit by a British monarch to the Irish Republic the following year. So, um, so I remember that was was very a very special moment, a very special moment. Uh, the Savlin or not, yeah, the Savlin inquiry wasn't by any means perfect. I have a lot of criticisms of it. I won't go into them now. Um, they actually, in the end, put all the blame practically on Colonel Wilford, uh, the man whom the Queen nominated for uh, an OBE at the end of 1972. So from hero to fall guy, I don't accept that. And uh, I do believe that Bloody Sunday was premeditated and pre-planned. And it wasn't a group of out-of-control soldiers, you know. But there was enough there to satisfy most of the families. And, uh, and the apology, I think, certainly helped. Um. In, but still no charges ever brought against any of the soldiers or anyone involved, yeah? Well, you know, um, I attended um, the Savile Inquiry. I, I gave testimony before it myself, but uh, I also attended two days when um, Soldier F, who was one of the psychopaths, uh, let loose in Glenfada Park. Mm. One of the other guys uh, was dead. He was actually shot as a mercenary in Africa. Um, but uh, I remember there watching Soldier F for two days, you know, and uh, at the end of the morning, I mean, every time he was asked a question, you know, he'd say, I can't remember, I have no memory of that, I can't recall that. That's what he said, that's how he parried all the questions. So I decided from lunchtime onwards and right through the following day to do a graph and I ticked it every time he told a lie, you know. And uh, by the end of one and a half days, I had calculated, I think it was 570 lies he told to the inquiry. Uh, I remember on the 5th of October, 1968 is when we say the beginning of the troubles began. I remember that day because I stole uh, a marathon bar, which was then, or a snicker bar, which was then a marathon bar. I remember it. And why do I remember it? Because I knew I was doing wrong. And what's the greatest wrong you can do is to take another human being's life. And this guy took multiple lives. And for him to say he had no memory, you know, mm -hmm. it was quite extraordinary, you know. But at the end, when his testing was over, uh, Lord Savile spoke to him very severely and he said, you know, uh, um, there are issues here of murder and there's also issues of purge raid, not just before one public inquiry, but two. And he said, you may be hearing from us again. So. There are no uh, investigations going on into the issue of murder, mm -hmm. and so I think that there will be um, further actions taken. And, and a number of the families do want soldiers to be prosecuted, whether others feel it's over as part of the peace process. So, but it's not over yet. I mean, yeah. there, there will be prosecutions. For sure. We have another question. Um, so you were discussing earlier about how when you're working on the book, you work from like 11 at night to 7 in the morning in fear of threats or whatever, um, and that you, you know, persevere despite the fact that you said you might be killed. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I guess, after the book was released, like the initial response by the British, and then also how, I guess, your personal life was impacted? Yeah. Uh, the reason why I, I worked from 11 until 6 was what I realized was during the day I'd be getting phone calls or people calling the house, and then you'd have to go back and you'd have to then try and, you know, re-read yourself into where you were and rethink yourself into it and it was a terrible tedious process where uh, starting at 11 and working until 6 or 7 in the morning I found that you know there was no interruptions and just that silence you know was very good from the point of view of investigative journalism so I find that very very helpful. Um, it was just that one night you know I realized the consequences that you know this is one of the most momentous moments in modern Irish history and, and in modern British history uh, and that there could be consequences. And so there was a fear. And after the book came out, uh, I mean, I was told just to be careful. And I remember on one occasion, I was being interviewed live, and uh, there was annoyance because uh, I was on a radio interview, and the guy said, oh, we know you're traveling from Dublin now to Derry. And it was kind of giving away my location. And so there were some people were annoyed that there was a lack of sensitivity there. But, you know, afterwards, I never really felt overly afraid because we were really very far into the um, the peace process at that stage and uh, and I really wasn't a, a huge threat to anyone 
Um, and the book was out anyway. So, you know, what, what good would it do, you know? Uh, the biggest impact was, I suppose, you know, for a while I had my 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. And uh, I remember one night uh, going into a pub. It was a big pub one Friday night looking for uh, a neighbor, an old neighbor I hadn't seen, Tony Muller. And uh, I remember as I walked in, like word went around that I was in, the place went silent, you know? Uh, but not anymore. That was, <laughs> that was my 15 minutes of fame. That's a, that was all, you know. But the, um, when the book was like first released, what was the like initial British response to it? Uh, that's interesting. You know, uh, there was a British uh, television company called Channel Four, and uh, Channel Four News came out at seven o'clock, and they were a highly respected um, news. Um, this particular Channel Four News at seven o'clock was probably more respected than the BBC mm -hmm. because they, they took on controversial subjects. And I remember I was in New York at the time and I got a phone call from one of their journalists called Lena Ferguson. And I had come up with a theory, which I still think is correct, which we, because it was a low budget movie, we didn't go into it in, in terms of that particular movie. But I believe the Three of the Dead may have been shot uh, by a sniper firing from the Derry Walls or the vicinity of the Derry Walls. And that's what really blew the whole thing open because that was a whole lot of new information that hadn't been considered in the first Bloody Sunday inquiry. And I remember Lena Ferguson saying, well, how comes we've never heard of this before? And I said, Lena, I understand your question because I have the same question. All I'm telling you, as I've read these 600 statements, one in 10 of them are saying that in addition to the soldiers firing at ground level, they were also firing from the walls. And there are three of the dead who have almost identical 45 degree downward trajectory wounds and one of the photographs I'm in one of the photographs where you can see Michael Kelly just where he shot and I'm looking in the direction where the shot comes in the second one it looks as though I've moved over to the body of Michael Kelly although I've no memory of it but in the photograph is Michael McDade and Michael McDade has his back to the paratroopers he's walking in the direction of Free Derry Corner so he's completely aligned with the Derry walls and three steps later he shot dead bullet enters his left cheek and exits his right shoulder. And if he maintained the stance that he had, and there's no reason to say that he turned around, then the only place that the shot could have come from was the dairy wall. So I had built up quite a compelling uh, body of evidence, which uh, Channel 4 actually embraced. And they did the first Channel 4 Bloody Sunday report based on my, my, uh, my research. And they did several other ones afterwards. But the fact that Channel 4 backed my book, I think, in a sense, made people afraid then to kind of criticize it. So in, in fairness, British journalists in that case, as with Paul Greengrass and Mark Redhead, showed great integrity and courage. Thank so, you. Thanks. Are there any other questions? So. Were you um, surprised by the reception of the, the film overall? After I mean, we were been talking about the book a lot, but you know, the, the film was obviously also really well received too. Yeah, right? With mean, the Sundance, when the, the audience yeah, awarded I, Sundance, I Sundance and stuff. So, I mean, I'm, how was that like being immersed? For, you know, not being exposed to the yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. Well, the first the thing I remember about then, Sundance was I thought I was having a heart attack. Yeah. I started having nosebleeds, and I couldn't understand <laughs> it the, oh, until oh. someone told me I was in a very high elevation. Yeah. So that was the hardest thing, first of all, in terms of trying to yeah. adjust. And then, you know, I went to, I remember I met a guy uh, on the plane who was going to Salt Lake City, uh, flying out from New York, and he had worked on a wonderful documentary, which I went to see, called uh, Revolution in Four-Part Harmony. And it was about the, the role of, of singing in the apartheid movement, bringing about the end of mm -hmm. the apartheid regime. And I loved it, you know, and I love four-part harmony. I love South African four-part harmony and also this, the, the protest songs and the hymns and so on that, that were sung. And I actually thought that was going to win it, you know? Yeah. And I was completely taken aback. Yeah. And, of course, I realized then the whole thing of the clapometer, you know, you would go and you'd listen to hear the <laughs> claps. Uh, you know, even today yeah. I was delighted when people clapped here at the end <laughs> of, the, of the movie, you yeah. know, to show their appreciation. And then the word came through that, we were going to get one of the top awards, yeah. and uh, so it was.
pretty interesting, you know. Yeah. And then Berlin as well. That was extraordinary. Yeah. That was extraordinary. Now, was that the story you were telling yesterday at, the, at Berlin when you met the woman you didn't yeah, know who she was? Yeah, well, maybe... I, I told now again, this shows kind of my innocence, you know, and the fact that I get into filmmaking by default. And this is a true story. Uh, I had met the director of the Berlin Film Festival. This might be a good one to finish on, maybe. You know, okay. I don't know well, where, we, where got, we do have one more question. All right. So. Okay. The, I had met the director the day before, and um, anyway, when it came to the award, no one told me what to do, and I was left sitting with the, uh, the wives, and Paul Greengrass, Mark Redhead, and Jimmy Nesbitt, the actor, they all rushed to the stage. So I'm watching this from the audience, and by this stage, everybody who has received their awards are up there, and the last award is Bloody Sunday. So this is live in German television, so the director is talking about it, and he starts to talk about Bloody Sunday, and, and then he looks around, and he looks at the audience, and then he stops, and he looks, and he says, where's Don? And so he insisted that I come up to the, the stage as well to be part of the presentation. So anyway, it comes to the end, curtains rolls, the end of the program, and we're all starting to mingle. And I'm beside this beautiful young uh, African American woman, and I, <laughs> God, I'm embarrassed not to think about it. <laughs> I said, "What's your name? And what do you do?" <laughs> God. So that night, my daughter, of course, is big into movies. Like yourselves, probably knows all the names of the actors and all the films they've been in. And um, I was saying, "God, I met this lovely young black woman," and. Uh, she said, what's her name? I says, God, I can't remember her name. I said, it sounds like a Christmas fruit. <laughs> and she says, Dad, Holly Berry? <laughs> I says, that's her. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's who it was, Holly Berry. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm sorry, Holly. <laughs> there um, I, go ahead. Do you have one? Actually, oops. Actually, I have two questions. Um, first question is, um, has both sides uh, between Northern Ireland and um, the British reconciled? And second, uh, and also, has there any been efforts um, by the um, by the British after, um, like what you said, um, their Channel Four efforts to support um, your your book? Yeah. And the second question is, uh, I come from Malaysia. It's a small country. It's uh, we're actually having a lot of similar. As I was watching yeah. the film, um, there was a riot last year we had, and it's. It's not for the same purpose, but how the chain of violence kind of spread is a very similar. Yeah. So I want to ask, um, and the riots are still going on, so I want to ask um, advice from you as for someone who has went past this. How should we approach this issue? Because violence is definitely not the case, and when a certain party doesn't want to listen to you, how yeah. should you? Well, I think they're two very good questions, and in a sense, just what you said there, for the second one, you've actually kind of answered it, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, in terms of uh, the situation now, I mean, we've had a peace process, and uh, you know, we owe great debt of gratitude in Ireland to the Clinton administration, and I always say that one of the greatest gifts that America ever gave to Ireland was Senator George Mitchell. Um, George Mitchell brought everybody together, and he listened to everybody with uh, enormous respect and uh, enormous patience. And he valued the position of everyone, trying to move everyone to a position where they could, you know, uh, agree on, you know, a peace process that mightn't be a perfect peace, but where there are no losers, but everybody's a winner, you know. And so we're, we're we're in a stage where we have a peace process and the relationship between Britain and Ireland has never been better for decades and decades and where we have a power sharing executive and in fact the two parties that sh which are power sharing now would have been considered perhaps the two most extreme. Sinn Féin would have been the political wing of the IRA and the DUP uh, would have been very you know, uh, malevolent at times, and uh, their rhetoric, I have no doubt, fueled violence from the, the loyalist side. And here they are, they're working together, like, and, uh, uh, and administering Northern Ireland, like, in terms of, like, bin collections and uh, in terms of just the normal things that have to happen in a, in a society. So that's quite hopeful. And, uh, and also, 
the British government and the Irish government, you know, have made two very important kind of gestures towards each community. One is that the British government have stated that we have no longer any strategic interest in Northern Ireland and that if a majority of people one day vote to become part of United Ireland, then we won't stand in their way. And the Irish Republic, reciprocating from that, have removed or amended Articles 2 and 3 of the Irish Constitution, which claim jurisdiction over the six counties of Northern Ireland. So now it's about you know, bringing about a united Ireland by persuasion rather than coercion. There are, of course, on both sides, dissidents, and there's still bitterness on both sides that have to be managed. But the general majority of people, I think, are, are very much in support of, of, the, um, of the peace process. And then your second question, in terms of Malaysia, by the way, I have a great admiration for a human rights lawyer and poet, Cecil Regenda. I don't know if you know of his artwork or of his, of his poetry, but he's a wonderful man. But um, I think, you know, what you said at the end, you know, no one's listening to him. I think listening is very important. You must not leave anybody out where they feel they're not being heard. And that was part of the peace process. I mean, John Hume, again, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, sadly is not a well man anymore, but he played a crucial role. But he always said, that there were three relationships that needed to be dealt with in dealing with the Irish question. There was the relationship between the two communities, Catholic and Protestant, and their identities within Northern Ireland. There was a relationship between Northern Ireland and Republic, and then there was a relationship between Ireland and the United Kingdom. And all of those relationships had to be managed, and that was done through dialogue. So in the case, I'm not up to speed in terms of what's happening in Malaysia at the moment, but I think that listening and reaching out, and also and I think this is why I love the story of the Christmas truce, you know. Even in the darkest days of Irish history, there were always good people in England and good people in Britain who cared about Ireland. And there's always friends on the other side. And I think it's important that we seek out those friends and we try to create those alliances, you know, because they're very important eventually when that moment, you know, when hope and history rhyme, when, uh, you know, those relationships can actually open up other channels as well. So listening and giving the opportunity for people to be heard is crucial. Well, I think we're about out of time, Don. So I just want to thank you so much for coming and talking with us today, sharing your experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.